Good afternoon. My name is Irene Barberena, and I'm a third year law student at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Today is Friday, November 10th, 2000. It is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Today I'm going to interview Judith Bernstein Baker, the first and now former Public Service Director here at Penn, and currently the Executive Director at HIAS, a nonprofit agency that provides social and legal services to immigrants and refugees. Ms. Bernstein Baker, thank you for agreeing to do this interview. Now we're going to get started with some questions on your childhood. Where am I looking? Okay. I was born in New York City in 1945 in an area known as um, Woodside or Sunnyside. Another name some people used to give this area is Greenwich Village on maternity leave because many people moved there from Manhattan after they had children who were progressive thinkers or free thinkers or artists or political activists. So it was a wonderful neighborhood. Were you raised there? I was raised in the borough of Queens, New York my whole life. Um, I spent six years in that particular neighborhood and uh, then in various other neighborhoods in, in Queens and I eventually spent my formative teenage years in an area called Long Island City, which it wasn't far away. Do you have any siblings? I do. I have one brother. Where were your parents born? My mother was born in Poland, and she came to the United States when she was about 12 years old. And my father was born in the United States in Bridgeport, Connecticut, to an immigrant, born into an immigrant family. So both my parents are Eastern European immigrants. And I'm sure that's influenced your, uh, your, your taking the position at HIAS, is that Definitely. Right? What did your parents do at the time? My mother um, is a dressmaker. She worked in a factory. She's a garment worker. She also was a union organizer for several years and remained active in the union, Local 22 of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which is now called Unite which had many Eastern European workers in it from the turn of the century and, the, and later on more in the 1920s up through the 60s. Uh, and uh, she stayed at home for several years as was the practice back then and then returned to, to the factory and remained a shop steward active uh, in the lower levels of the union. And my father was a translator and an editor and an aspiring writer who was not able to publish too many works. He spoke uh, about seven languages and was very involved in the struggle for democracy and very much against uh, fascism during the war and because of his linguistic ability and his contacts knew many anti-fascist leaders. So our house was always uh, constantly filled with very interesting people from both sides of the family. And how did your parents' experiences influence you as a young child? Well, uh, both my parents are progressive thinkers. Um, my father was a great humanist, and he taught us as children that um, money was not the be-all and end-all of life, and that our values of caring for other people, of supporting the people who didn't have as much as we did, although we didn't have very much, um, was really more important than money. And my mother supported him in this viewpoint. And actually, she supported us economically as well. In those years, a lot of women didn't work. Uh, and so my mother was a bit of a trailblazer in the sense that she went and maintained her job uh, after uh, we were a certain age. She returned to work to help support the family. My father worked for himself for many years, um, translating, uh, and he made a very modest living, so we really needed my mother's income uh, for the family survival. Were you involved in any uh, public service as a child? I think I've always been a little involved in public service and in, in different aspects. 
I guess the first thing I ever did publicly was um, when one of my neighbor's sons got polio in those years. It was before, uh, we were just developing sock vaccine, so there was a lot of polio around. And I felt very bad for him. And s we were all very modest income in that area, so I decided to sell my toys so I could get money to give him a gift. And I put all my used toys out side and I had several ta takers and I did manage to make about five dollars and buy him a gift which was very appreciated by the family. And what did your parents think about that? They, they thought it was very nice of me. They thought it was a little odd that I would sell so many toys but they were very supportive. They were proud of me. Outside of public service were you involved in any other extracurricular activities during school or well, during high school, I was editor of my high school paper. And actually, I was involved uh, in that period at the beginnings of kind of an anti-war movement were beginning then. It was a very difficult time, the 50s, because there was a great fear over the nation on many levels. One was a great fear of communism. And we were uh, trained to uh, take shelter under our desks uh, in preparation for a possible nuclear attack. Uh, so there was, a, there was a very chilling atmosphere in the country at that time. It was a period of McCarthyism where people were afraid to speak out uh, and tell their views. And this affected my family greatly. Uh, I, um, I believe my first action in high school uh, was that um, I refused to take cover under the desk because, as I explained, I was a very precocious young woman. And as I explained to my teachers that it wouldn't make any difference, I would still be dead. And I didn't want to participate in what I thought was a fraud, a lie. So I refused to take cover. There were about three or four of us in the school who did this protest. And we were fortunate because the teachers actually supported us. And so they allowed us to sit in the hall in a special area while the others took cover. And they respected us because in our school it was a working class school and Really, only about 60 of us out of a class of 300 went on to college. And the four of us who refused to take cover, we were among the 60. So we were kind of the intellectuals of, of the school. And in a way, we were pampered. So I refused to take cover. And a few months later, we decided, the high school students decided, we would have a very big show uh, of refusing to take cover by going down to City Hall. And we would all refuse to take cover at one time. And I, I must have been 14 or 15 at the time. And we did. And the police attempted to uh, get us off the street, including arresting some people, because it was considered very uh, unpatriotic and also uh, not done uh, according to the rules. So it was a very uh, anxiety-producing event, uh, but I managed uh, to um, leave it peacefully. And that was, I, I guess that I would say that was my first public protest. Have you been involved in any other protests since then? Oh, yes. And all through high school, we, we were following the uh, developing civil rights movement and uh, very exciting times in New York. Uh, at that time, uh, the students in the South, predominantly the African American students, were bravely desegregating um, lunch counters by sitting in lunch counters. At that time, you know, they had segregated lunch counters, and African American students couldn't sit at the white lunch counters. And we would watch this on television. We would see thing, kids being beaten up our age or a little older. And we decided we had to do something in the North to show our solidarity, to show our support. So every Saturday morning, a number of us would gather in front of Woolworths, uh, which was a big um, 
variety store called a five and dime store. And we would pick at Woolworths because we would be asking the Woolworths in the north to pressure their branch offices in the south to desegregate their facilities. And in the beginning, there were maybe 20, 30 students who would show up from across the city of New York. But by the year's end, we would have three, 400 people a week coming down uh, to pick it. And it was mu as much a social occasion as a protest. We, we'd meet students our own age from various parts of the city. We'd learn different songs and different chants. And um, eventually, of course, the desegregation laws fell. And, uh, now we have a situation where at least there is uh, no longer de jure segregation in public accommodations. Did you continue these types of activities in college? I see that you went to the State University of New York at Binghamton. Yes, um, of course I did. I, once you realize in those years, um, not as many people went to college, and those of us who are fortunate to go and in those years, when you went to a state college, if you were a city kid like myself, it was kind of like uh, really going to California. <laughs> it was a big deal uh, for a, a lower middle class person to, to leave New York City, because a lot of my friends ended up going to city college. That's what people did who didn't have a lot of money. But I was fortunate I got some scholarships, and I was able to go to this state school. And although the school was in an isolate, fairly isolated part of New York State, or I wouldn't say isolated, but there were not huge cities in upstate New York, Binghamton, New York, we had a very activist student body, mainly drawn from New York City. Many of the students were from New York City. And we did things to support the civil rights movement and later got very involved in the anti-war movement against the Vietnam War. I. Uh, I guess I was considered one of the campus leaders of both efforts. Describe your most vivid memory during these times in college. I have two very vivid em em uh, memories in terms of the protest activities, if that's what you're referring to. The first is um, when a local department store announced that they would give a dollar to the first 100 people who showed up as a promotion to their new store opening. And of course, back then, $100 was a lot of money, probably more than $1,000 today. And we wanted to raise money for the civil rights movement and for the students in the South who were going on freedom rides where they would uh, force the desegregation of the buses and the bus stations. So we decided um, we would organize 100 students to show up first, and we'd get $100 that we could then send to the South. The only problem is it was about minus 5 below 0. It was in, in January. And um, we were very cold, and we had to show up at about 5 AM in the morning because we had to be first. And we did. We showed up, and we froze, but we did whatever we could to keep warm. Now that created a little tension with the people in the town because they felt we were kind of uh, commandeering all the money and they were very resentful. And uh, the store developed a very creative solution. They gave our group a donation of $100 and then they let people, the rest of the people, line up and um, go through the first come, first serve procedure that they had originally announced. So the first lesson I learned was if you persevere and you're on the moral high ground, um, you can change uh, a policy or a program and you can benefit uh, the people you're hoping to benefit. So that was a very important lesson. But I, I remember that because of the weather. <laughs> it was very cold. and. Uh, we would do things like that as, as young people. The second thing I remember that was very important was when we had to make a decision as a student group about our position on the draft. Now at that time, there was a certain exemption for students 
and many of the college presidents wanted to maintain this exemption, otherwise they wouldn't have a student body. And they felt that if students attended college, it's in our national defense interest to have them finish. So they wanted to maintain this special exemption for students. This created a moral dilemma for us as students because are we going to be putting ourselves in a privileged position, in a special position by fighting for this exemption? Or should we rather take the position that this is a bad war or this war shouldn't be fought in the way it's being fought? And nobody should have to serve. In other words, should we ally ourselves with the working class and the under um, and unemployed people who were forced to join the army because there were not many jobs back then? And uh, we took the position that uh, we would oppose uh, sending people to the war, no matter who they were, that we did not want any special privileges uh, for college students, which was against our own interest in a way, and of course it didn't affect me directly because I'm a, I was a woman and they weren't drafting women and they still don't draft women. But I remember we decided to take this position during Parents' Day and a lot of parents were visiting the university and uh, we decided to schedule an outdoor discussion and of course parents were very nervous because they didn't want their kids to go into the army. And, president of the university was scheduled to speak with me on the podium. And the president talked about the importance of the student exemption to try to allay some of the parents' anxieties and fears and to also try to urge them to lobby for this special exemption. And then I got up on the podium and I had to disagree respectfully with that position. And of course, again, it was a hard position to take because the students did not, many of the students felt it was the wrong position from their own self-interest point of view. But in the long run, I think it was the right position, principal position. Uh, so that, I, I remember that, that rally very vividly and I remember how embarrassed the president was that I didn't kind of go along with the program. But I also remember the strength I got from the reception I did get from the students who really understood why we had to take that position, although it was one that in the short term isolated some of us from the other students who thought we should be more pro-student and just fight for their special draft exemption. Have you ever encountered any similar kind of opposition in your public uh, commu interest community? Well, um, I think it's always difficult to take a position that may you may think in the short term doesn't really benefit you, but it's done in the greater good. And life is full of choices, and I feel you you often are called upon to take these kind of positions in your work, in the way you live your life, in your career choice. Uh, so I'm trying to, I'd like to be specific. Um, well, I, this is not controversial to me, but I, I can see how it would be controversial to other people. Very recently, uh, the governor of Pennsylvania announced that um, homeowners would all get a hundred dollars rebate because we had a budget surplus. Well, I could use the money uh, as well as the next person, but I felt that there should be more money going to the schools. The Philadelphia schools um, need uh, need funds from Harrisburg. So I joined with several other people to return my hundred dollars and ask them to donate it, you know, donate it back to the schools. Uh, but that was an easy decision in a sense because while I needed the money, I wasn't starving. I think it would have been much harder if I was destitute. So I, I think we're confronted with these decisions all the time, not just about money, uh, but about um, where you live what benefits you, 
uh, short term and long term. This very firm commitment to public service is reflected in your diverse social work experience. Um, I know that according to your CV, you, uh, after college, you worked with the Company of Young Canadians and the Department of Welfare in Rochester before going on to get your Master of Social Work at Penn. Can you tell me a little about these experiences and what role they had uh, in your pursuit of a Master's in Social Work? Well, I come, I have many relatives in my family who are social workers, not immediate relatives. And I guess ever since I sold my toys, uh, there's been an aspect in me of wanting to help people. Uh, so going to social work school, I guess, was a culmination of that. Uh, when I worked in Canada, I worked uh, largely with the immigrant community, and I felt I needed a lot more training on developing organizations, on intervening with people in crisis, and I felt I also needed some more reflection and study in that area. And so I was fortunate to be able to attend the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Work. And in those years, the coming near the end of the Cold War, where we had money so we wouldn't fall behind our main opponent, the former Soviet Union, there were actually grants and scholarships available. So the University of Pennsylvania was very generous to me and applied for a grant from the Office of uh, Mental Health. So I actually was able to attend graduate school without it paying any tuition. And uh, that was sort of a wonderful situation in which I uh, could take advantage of both my prior experience of working in the field and also of the education that the School of Social Work uh, gave to me. Uh, I think social work is about social change, whether it's social change working with an individual, or social change working with a group, or social change working with, uh, on a national level, with policy. So it, it seemed to be a very logical step for me to, to study in that area after all my experiences. After getting your master's at Penn, you spent the next eight years doing social work before deciding to go to law school. When did you make that decision to go to law school, and what motivated that decision? Well, I was always the kind of social worker who was an advocate. I always tried to learn the rules and then see how the rules could be expanded if they weren't fair or even changed. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, when I was a caseworker at the Welfare Department in Monroe County, which is in Rochester, I had a big responsibility. I had to give out money. I had to go visit people and I had to decide whether or not they got money and I had to decide if they were having relationships with men that would prevent them from getting money. It was, a, it was an awesome responsibility. And I read the rules very carefully to find out what I could do and what I could could not do. And I noticed that among my clients, that's what we called people we worked with, the people who are a little economically better off seem to, to, to do better with their children. They seem to be motivated to better themselves. So whenever an opportunity arose for me to use the rules to get somebody more resources, I did. So I learned the rules on getting furniture for people. And I learned that uh, a very often unused rule was that if you, you know, moved into a new apartment or you had an emergency, you could apply for furniture money and you could get furniture money. And I had several clients I was able to get furniture money for uh, to help them. And in fact, I was called into my supervisor's office and. I was accused of being the caseworker that gave away the most furniture money. But I also explained to this very supervisor that my caseload had more clients attending community college and getting training than most of the other caseloads. And I really have to 
attribute this to the fact that we developed a relationship where I encouraged them to better themselves and they understood that I would do whatever I could uh, to bring them the resources they needed to do this. So I always was an advocate even if I had an individual caseload and I always liked to study the rules so I knew what was possible. And when I uh, moved to Philadelphia, uh, I designed a placement for myself in social work school uh, in community legal services because I was always fascinated by the relationship between law and social work. And I designed a placement so that I would work uh, with tenants who were having problems being evicted and at that time, when I was in the School of Social Work, uh, there was a great tenant movement in Philadelphia and lots of organizing going on of big buildings. And I became a liaison between these tenant groups and community legal services. So I became even more interested with how you use the law with groups and how you train uh, individuals who are trying to better their conditions uh, in how to use the law. So after I finished social work, I obtained a job in community legal services and it was a very fluid organization at the time and I found I was doing casework and I was uh, doing organizing and I also found that uh, somebody would be out of the office and they'd want me to represent somebody at a fair housing hearing, kind of like that. Uh, type of advocacy. So I became so involved with lawyers through my work at Community Legal Services, I realized that um, I could do this. I, I could also be a lawyer. Uh, and so that's what uh, got me interested in uh, going back to law school after having my social work degree for several years. And why did you decide to learn these skills at Temple Law School? Well, I went back to law school when I was older. I was about 39 years old. I had two young children at the time, and my husband is a public defender, was, is uh, a public defender, so we had a very modest income. And I decided that Temple would be the kind of place that we could afford. And also at that time, there were very few, if any, older women, especially women with children at uh, schools like Penn or the other elite schools. So I felt I would be more comfortable at Temple. Uh, and uh, I was able to finish Temple and not have too much of a loan burden. That was a very important thing back then, as it is even more so now because I knew I wanted to do some sort of public interest law and I could not graduate with a heavy loan burden because they didn't have loan forgiveness back then. So I had to go to the, a place that was affordable that uh, taught me the skills I needed to know, so I, I chose Temple. Do you think your orientation toward public service and public interest law was reinforced at Temple Law School? Yes. Uh, I don't know if it was reinforced by the formal curriculum at the time, but I engaged in a lot of extracurricular activities that enforced, reinforced uh, my orientation. Uh, at that time, we had a food stamp clinic, which we ran as a model. Uh, uh, well, the Penn food stamp clinic was our model, and there was a lot of cross-fertilization between the Temple students and the Penn students. And I was very active in the formation of that clinic and the running of that clinic and uh, several other activities. Um, so I, I would say a lot of my extracurricular activities were as formative as my um, curricular activities. After graduating from law school, you accepted a clerkship for the Honorable Beryl Caesar, who has since passed away. In describing the great influence Judge Caesar had on your career, you were quoted in the Legal Intelligencer as saying that he showed you that every case is a story in search of justice and that the judging process was a blend of understanding the law, the facts of the case, and the social issues. Do you confront every case that reaches your desk as a story in search of justice? And do you think that judges you have confronted in your practice 
share Judge Caesar's view of the judging process? I don't think every judge sh shares that view. I think he was uh, very special in that regard, especially because I think he, it's always a balance uh, between the law and the facts and social policy on how you come down on a case. I don't know that all judges have the balance that he had. Some judges, uh, as you know from your own studies here at law school, uh, take a strict constructionist view, which is to say uh, uh, they, they're wordsmiths. They look at the words and they don't necessarily look at the larger public policies or social values behind the words. And then there are others that uh, emphasize um, the facts or emphasize the social policy concerns. And it, uh, and so I think it, there are very different approaches uh, to interpreting the law and applying the law among judges and among lawyers. But I think Judge Caesar had a very good balance. Not necessarily would be my balance, but it was a balance I deeply respected. For example, we had a case, my first case with the judge, of a woman who did not speak English. She was injured in a hospital accident when an orderly uh, ran a, uh, one of these carts into her. There was no question that there was liability in that case. The issue is whether there were any damages to her. This was a woman who was forced to return to work uh, within weeks of the accident because her husband was dying of cancer. And as I read the transcript, I realized that she did not understand a lot of the questions and that there was a lot being lost in the translation. And I really don't think she conveyed to the jury why she returned to work. So the jury made an odd finding. They found liability, but they found that there were no damages awarded to her. And because of this, um, I was concerned. And uh, this was the first opinion I had to write for the judge. And I wrote two opinions. I wrote one opinion that I felt reflected what was really going on and social justice concerns, that she didn't convey why she had returned to work and that maybe the jury uh, thought that she wasn't that injured and didn't get an entire picture because of the interpreting issue. However, I could find very little case law because it was a jury verdict and you don't overturn a jury verdict very easily. And then I wrote a second opinion that was much more consistent with the case law and um, did not overturn the jury's verdict. And I gave them both opinions. And I said, this one, the first one, the one that didn't have so much, I found one case to support it, didn't have a lot of case law to support it, but to me it was the more just opinion. And the second one, he wouldn't be overturned on. And it was, his, you know, then he decided. And uh, what he did was a tremendous learning experience for me. He called both, these were all in post-trial motion, so he called both attorneys in who had argued the case, the attorney for the hospital and the attorney for this Italian client. And he said, you know, my clerk found this one case which intrigues me, and I, I'm thinking of agreeing to uh, a new trial on this matter. What do you think of this defense counsel? And I was surprised that the defense counsel said, Your Honor, we'll settle the case today. We'll give her X amount of dollars. And um, the case was settled and the client got some money without any litigation. And I don't know if to this day if the judge would actually have ruled for a new trial, but he used it to try to get the just result. And that had a big impression on me. And it was the just result because what I heard afterwards is the defense attorney walked up to me and he said, you know, I'm so glad you found that case. I felt so guilty about this case because even though I represent the hospital, I did poll the jury after the verdict 
and one of the members of the jury said they gave their decision that she wasn't entitled to any money because they were convinced she got work, workers' compensation, which she really did. I'm not even sure she did get workers' compensation, number one. But number two, under our law, workers' compensation uh, is not to be considered in a judgment for damages in, a per, in an injury case. It, it's a matter of public policy. And he had an ethical dilemma because he had heard that's why the jury deliberated the way it did, and he knew that was wrong, but he was the only one that knew that, and he didn't feel he could share it with anybody to protect his client's interests. So we gave him an easy ethical out by, by taking the high road, the just road, and it, it worked to everybody's benefit, his conscience and the poor lady who was injured. After working for Judge Caesar for two years, you worked for the Support Center for Child Advocates for two years before accepting the position as director of the University of Pennsylvania's Public Service Program in March of 1990. How did you first learn of this position and why were you interested in it? I learned of the position actually informally through friends. They said, you know, I think this would be a good position for you. You, you seem to have been involved for a long time in public service. You know a lot of people. And while I was at the support center, a big part of my job was to train and recruit pro bono attorneys. And through my work in support, at the support center, I was connected to a vast network of pro bono organizations and law firms um, who did pro bono work. Uh, so when the official job announcement was made, I applied. and. Um, I had a real feel for how I could create the program, which again was sort of a natural evolution from all these past years of experience in Philadelphia. By that time I'd lived in Philadelphia, you know, 20 odd years and I, I knew the public interest law um, community both from my work in community legal services as a non-lawyer and my later work in, in uh, in the support center and other activities I was engaged in. Did you ever have this vision of utilizing law students to help the public interest community? Did you ever share or have this vision before you heard of this position? Had that ever come to your mind before? Well, I, I always felt very strongly that law students should do public interest and pro bono it's in some way for credit or not credit, whatever model worked, because it was such a rich experience for me when I was a law student. So I, I, I felt that it was both a learning experience for the student uh, as well as a much needed resource. But I didn't really have a vision of an exact program of how it would look. I just had an instinct that if you created interesting opportunities, um, the students would take it and run with it, just as we did, just as I did when I was a student. Remember, I went to school late in life, law school, and so I wasn't so far out of law school when this job opportunity came along. Even though I had been in the public interest legal community for many years, it was not as, a, as an attorney. Do you see any differences in the public interest community uh, in law schools today from the type of public interest communities that you were a part of when you were in law school? Well, I think there's more institutional support, much more institutional support for public interest and public service in law schools. But unfortunately, there's also a lot, a lot more barriers as well, uh, especially for those seeking a full-time career. Uh, the funding cuts for legal services, the struggles nonprofit organizations uh, undergo, the loan burden, these have all, these are all greater in some ways than 20, 30 years ago. So while I, I see a, a lot of institutional support in the legal establish, in, in the academic establishment, we haven't really been able to build that kind of infrastructure outside of of academia for full time or substantial uh, public interest and in pro bono work. 
and I, I also see this, it, it goes in cycles. So now, um, for example, many big firms to compete with other big firms and get the best students have to pay very big salaries. Because they have to pay very big salaries, they have to do a lot of billable hours. Because they have to do a lot of billable hours, there's less time to do pro bono. So there are many, many large economic forces at work here that, uh, despite our best intentions, can undercut even the uh, most ambitious uh, public interest or pro bono uh, program in a law school. As director of the mandatory service program at Penn, did you personally feel at the time that pro bono work should be required at law schools? Do you still feel the same way? I feel that some things should be required. I don't think it necessarily has to be this mo the model at Penn, which is that uh, you do a certain number of hours and you go through the, a pro an organized uh, placement process. I think there are many models of how this can occur, including clinical education uh, and externships. Uh, I'd include those as va very valid experiences. So, uh, but I do feel, yes, there should be some required effort on the part of students to do some sort of public service. I think uh, we are, lawyers are a profession, we regulate ourselves, we license ourselves, there's a lot of unmet legal need and we, we have to, whenever we can, fulfill uh, our responsibility uh, personally to, to meeting those needs. Um, and I think the law schools are a good training ground to instill that ethic in, in new lawyers. And it's also a time when you can instill that ethic, when you don't have the billable hour pressure, you do have other pressures, but I don't think law students realize what a wonderful time law school is until they get out and they have to, uh, you know, work many, many hours a week. So it's a good time to do it. Do you think lawyers should also uh, be required to do some pro bono work in their practice? Required? Do you think it should be mandatory? I would like to see a system where lawyers who can afford to or above a certain income level, if they, can't, if they don't do pro bono, they donate the equivalent of several hours of funds to a public interest organization. Um, I would like to see a greater emphasis on pro bono and public interest, and I would like to see that built into the firm's evaluation system of someone and their training. Uh, I, I would stop short at this point of requiring it, even though I feel so strongly about it myself, I don't see how anybody couldn't do it. But there may be instances, uh, hardship instances, uh, just like we have a hardship exemption public service program where a young attorney is starting out and, and they just don't have the time to do pro bono. They, they really, you know, many solo practitioners just they don't have an income. On the other hand, you find a lot of solo practitioners take pro bono cases. It's a great experience, great training. So, uh, but I do stop short of, of a requirement, uh, but I I think, at least with the bigger firms or the people with resources, there should be a very strong culture and maybe even a requirement uh, for the people with more resources. Going back to March 1990, when you first took the position as director of Penn's Public Service Program, how much latitude were you given in implementing the program? Well, I, latitude isn't even the word because nobody knew <laughs> what we were implementing. I said I was, I was given huge latitude. Um, we, the the um, committee that initiated the requirement, though, was very thoughtful. And uh, we, we did have guidelines uh, to work with. So uh, we had 70 hours of work, and there was already a definition of what that work should be. Um, and, uh, but within those guidelines, um, I was free to do whatever I thought the program required. Did you feel a lot of pressure to make it work? 
Well, you always want to do a good job, and I, I thought this was such a unique program uh, that it was important that it worked. So I guess, yes, I did feel some, I, I did feel pressure to make it work. Did you give, give yourself any room for failure? Or I really give, not being able I to rarely watch give them. myself room for failure. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't usually take on a task uh, if I don't think it can happen. So I guess my room for failure comes before I commit to doing something. And this, this seemed like a very viable program. Did the law school give you any, uh, any room uh, in case that didn't work out? Did they have any other options? Um, were they sure this was going to work? No, they were not sure at all. And the first few years, I was in four different offices, and including a closet, and sharing an office in the library. Uh, yeah, there wasn't a lot of thought about, you know, a full-fledged program in those early years. Um, but, and I believe after the second year or the third year, we, it built into the requirement was an evaluation piece. And so the program was evaluated uh, by the faculty and Fortunately, by that time, it was successful, largely due to the students' efforts, their own efforts, um, and their own enthusiasm. Uh, so, so at that point, I think uh, that was a turning point when the program became more institutionalized, and we got we got a better office, and we finally got a, a public service program is in a wonderful office now, probably one of the nicest in the law schools. You said the students were very enthusiastic and uh, helpful in uh, contributing to the success of the program. Did you ever find any or feel any resistance from the law school community or the public interest community here in Philadelphia? Yeah, I think there were instances of resistance from, from, from all quarters, uh, especially with such a new and broad program. Um, there were uh, supervisors, uh, people in the public interest community that felt that they didn't want to or couldn't invest the time in supervising students because uh, on a sort of a cost-benefit analysis, they weren't getting enough out of students and sometimes placements didn't work and sometimes stu supervisors and students didn't mesh and there were personality or other clashes. So, uh, so that, that, that was a problem. Um, secondly, there were some students who had very strong feelings that this shouldn't be required. Uh, and that we've always had a f several students every year who had very strong feelings about that. Um, but it, uh, it was a graduation requirement like some of the other courses. And so uh, once that was made very clear to students, uh, they went along with them, and some of the students who were the most uh, resentful actually ended up having wonderful public service experiences once they got over uh, their resentment. Um, maybe their heart and their head weren't connected. I guess they intellectually felt this wasn't right. It was illogical to require pro bono. But then when they got engaged in it, they realized it was a good experience. I'm thinking of one student in particular who was very much opposed to the program. And we had lots of trouble finding him the right placement. And I remember after he graduated, two years after he graduated, he called me and he was now working as an attorney general somewhere in the public sector. And he wanted to know if he could uh, how to start a street law program and whether he could use law students. <laughs> Did you think it would be especially challenging, challenging implementing this program at Penn Law where most graduates uh, go directly to big corporate law firms? You know, I didn't really know that much about Penn Law when I came, so maybe if I knew it back then, maybe if I knew back, maybe if I knew uh, Penn better before I took the job, I would have been uh, very challenged, uh, but everything was so new, and I was, you know, learning the culture of the law school. I really didn't really think about it. I, I felt like ha uh, this was an important thing to do. I felt that we could create very interesting experiences for students. So um, I actually didn't think that would be much of a challenge. Um, 
because I think law students on the whole do want some sort of hands-on experience or an experience uh, where they f feel they're um, not just focused inwardly, not just focused on themselves. And uh, so I wasn't too worried about that. Mm. Definitely a different culture though. I, as I said, I, I went to a law school where there were lots of people of many different ages and backgrounds, which was the Temple model. Now Penn's becoming that, but back when I first started here, that was not uh, what Penn looked like. So what do you think was the biggest obstacle in uh, building the program? The biggest obstacle was, and probably still is, um, is finding um, quality experiences for students within the time frame outlines of the program and um, developing and maintaining a relationship with the many, many, for want of a better word, field supervisors uh, in, in the program so that they would, uh, you know, keep, keep returning and keep wanting to sponsor students. Uh, the one development in the program that I encouraged, but also there was a dialectic there, I, I encouraged it and then, I, and then uh, the students encouraged me to encourage, was the whole growth of some of the student projects or the more organized big projects. When I, when I first started, I didn't know if we'd have a lot of big projects like the food stamp clinic or KSAC, which developed uh, while we were doing, in the beginning of the public service program, which is the custody and support advice clinic, which today performs a great, great service in the Philadelphia community. Um, and the work with the homeless. And of course, this has its ebbs and flows, and, it, and it's not always an even development, but um, the idea of developing projects and helping students become leaders in those projects uh, was really not on the front burners of what I thought should happen, but when I saw how successful they were and how meaningful those experiences were to the students, then that became a whole new dimension of the program. What has been the most rewarding part about putting together this program almost by yourself at Penn? Well, it's very rewarding that it's institutionalized um, here at Penn and that now it's doing even more things and uh, uh, sponsoring more conferences and more uh, opportunities for the practicing bar and the academic community and the student community to, to relate to each other. But, you know, I, I guess on a very simple level, uh, the most rewarding is when I see some of the students who are now practitioners run up to me and want to tell me about their latest pro bono case or want to tell me about their lives and what they're doing and, or have a question about uh, an area of law and want to discuss it, um, that it was memorable for, for some of the students. Now it's not going to be memorable for every student, I understand that. And the other thing is now I'm a supervisor in the program, so I get to supervise the, the students and um, that's a very rewarding experience um, to see it from the other end and to see both the limitations with respect to the time limits that they have to spend, but the potential. Uh, and, you know, I have had one student say to me recently that uh, when she, she's had, she has many offers from many major firms and she's decided that she's owned going to go to a firm where she's going to be able to do pro bono work, particularly in immigration, and you know, that, that's very rewarding. Do you think Penn's Law Public Service Program has influenced other law schools to follow suit? I definitely think it's influenced other law schools, although they may not have adopted this model. Uh, we were called and consulted by many law schools who were trying to begin a variety of initiatives. And um, I think uh, even locally, the Temple program a lot, they have a new public service department or program. And a lot, some of it is, you know, modeled after the Penn program. But even nationally, 
we had a great influence uh, on uh, making public interest and pro bono uh, of an option for, for schools. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I don't know the lay of the land now because I've been away for almost three years. So I don't know all the varieties of programs that have been developed. Uh, but I will say that I recently got a call from a, somebody in, uh, in Virginia Law School, and I remember there was a public service uh, coordinator in that law school who I uh, was a colleague, and we talked, and this student remembered, re was referred to me by that colleague. So, so there's still a lot of uh, networking going on and, and a lot of uh, efforts at this. I, I mean, the biggest question, of course, is always a resource, resource question for law schools. Well, some schools have followed in, the, uh, in this model of instituting pro bono programs. Why might some schools, or why, actually, why are many schools reluctant to institute this kind of uh, program into their curriculum? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Um, for one thing, um, some schools uh, are going the route of uh, more of a clinical, expanding their clinical programs because uh, one of the advantages of a clinical program is that uh, the supervisors are academics and um, are always available and that uh, the learning of the student uh, comes first, whereas in a public service program, the learning is the performance performance of public service and meeting an unmet need. So they're really different emphasis. And a lot of the supervision is, 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 is not intense. It's, here's three issues, can you research these issues? So there's a reluctance, I think, from a, a supervisory point of view. The second, uh, I think, is a resource question. I think a public service program does call for some resources, and uh, some schools are reluctant to put the resources into that area and all, you know everybody's always struggling with resources and and, and, and their priorities uh, so um, and the third is uh, you know the vision of the practice of law and what's important um, you know the, the as I said the one of the models is the clinical model but the real the real compelling force behind the clinical model is one of education, is to teach by doing the practical experience of lawyering. Now, in, you also do good in the clinical model, and in, for many students, that's a transformative experience of representing somebody in a clinical setting, and it really uh, prepares them and turns them on to either pro bono or a career in public interest. But the main mission in clinical education is one of, of student learning. Um, so s sometimes there's a tension, and this, this is a fascinating topic that I don't have time to deal with, but there's a tension between uh, focusing on student learning and focusing on meeting an unmet community need. Uh, for example, uh, in the public service program, um, if there's a need for a student to do child custody work because um, there's not enough lawyers to handle child custody cases, I would emphasize that in the program and I would create a lot of placements and the student would have the experience of doing child custody work, but only child custody work because it wasn't just about their learning, although that was something they did, it was about providing a service and being uh, uh, responsible as a professional to meet unmet needs. But if I was a clinician, I might say, well, you know, I think it would be better academically if a, child, if a student had a custody case and an unemployment case and went into this court and that court. So, so, so there are different philosophies and orientations, even though the outcome may be very similar. In other words, in clinical legal education or externships, those who finish them may be just or even more motivated to do public service and pro bono than somebody who has a more limited public service experience. But the, um, the underlying educational goals and the values driving those programs are very different. 
Uh, having said that, clinical education, which I think is, I'm a real fan of clinical legal education and, it's, and externships, is a, is a program that some law schools view as very costly. So, so I don't think pro bono or public service is at all an alternative to clinical legal education. It's really a different model with different uh, both educational and professional values. Um, but it really, a big program really exposes students, uh, more students, uh, to public service uh, opportunities, even though um, they may be shorter term and not as intense in terms of learning. Uh, I mean, in the, in the wider screen, you know, uh, wider, wider scheme of things, our profession is prey to many forces, economic forces. You want to educate students so that eventually they are employable. And it's prey to the resources of a law school, and it's prey to larger societal forces that tomorrow could end a whole practice of of law, as one of my friends said, I don't know if we're going to have employment discrimination law if uh, certain people get into power and there's a certain administration. So, so law is very subject uh, to, to larger forces. So it may be that some law schools are reluctant uh, because they're pressured by any one of these larger forces to conform their curriculum uh, accordingly. You described the, a little while ago the tension between student learning and actually being a responsible uh, profession professional. Do you think it's important to the clients that the students' hearts be in be in their work, or do you think that uh, do you think that's an important part of the pro bono work at law schools? Do you think it's important that a student's heart be in it? Well, I think it's always good if your heart's in it. I, I think it makes you much more motivated to do a good job, to represent your clients zealously, to uncover the uh, unique issues that may be affecting your client, to want to go that extra mile. But I don't think it's necessary. I think uh, we learn in our profession what our professional responsibility is, and it is to represent a client competently and with zeal uh, within the bounds of the law. So I would say if somebody represents somebody competently, their heart doesn't have to be in it, although I would hope their heart would be in it. Colleagues of yours have called you a true superwoman, an amazing person, and an important role model. After spending eight years at Penn Law and putting together a hugely successful program, one that has recently won a national award, do you feel that you have left behind a legacy here at the law school? I hope I've left a small legacy. In addition to leaving a legacy in law school, I have two kids. I hope they're a legacy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope I've left a legacy. Um, and it's a very nice thing to be able to leave a legacy in such good hands because I, I, I feel uh, the program is going along very successfully under the current direct director. Uh, Susan Feathers and the program director, uh, Pam Mertzark Wolf. And I still have many contacts with them, and it's, a, it's really a pleasure. So I, I think I've left a small legacy, and that's always nice. I think the most important part of, for me, the most important uh, part of practicing law is to leave some legacy or to impact someone in a real significant way because it impacts you. And I have been so lucky that uh, I've been able to leave this legacy of the program in such good hands and now in my current work to be able to win cases so people get political asylum and begin new lives or they be bring their family members over or they finalize their status so they can work legally and not be terrified that they'll be shipped on a boat back to a country and engaged in a civil war. Uh, to me, that is a very, very special honor. It really is an honor 
to, to, to work with either a program that's successful or clients whose um, dreams are, are realized because you really gain more than what you leave behind or the impact. It's really your gain. Um, it, it, that's the only way I, I can explain it. In, in our life, we, we don't have much of an opportunity to see that kind of impact or kind of change. We really don't. And when, we, when we're able to, to do it at, at whatever level, it, it really is an honor. And it's really not just you. It's, it's, it's you in relationship to a program or a person. It's really a dialectical and a dynamic relationship. So it's never just one person. So I was, you know, I was lucky here at Penn. Yes, I left a legacy, but we had a dean that supported a program. We had faculty members that supported it, and we had a student body that, if they didn't support it, you could work with them. Well, your, your commitment to public service is definitely impressive, and you've left very big shoes to fill here at the Public Service Program. It was definitely a pleasure interviewing you. Thanks. Thank you.